Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Barry Nalong. Thank you everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Look, look, this presentation tonight will be a combination of a, playing a few audios, a couple of videos, and me doing a little bit of talking. I guarantee you now we will, we will be out of here, or I'll be finished by half past eight at the latest. So, and if someone can give me like a bit of a signal after I've been talking for 30 minutes, because I don't want to be too late tonight. But I'll, what I'd like to do is start off with an audio of Sydney Eye. I'm going to play a few very short excerpts out of some of our oral histories. We interviewed Sydney Eye very early last year, just prior to his 102nd birthday. We interviewed him twice. He was really patient with us, spent a few hours with us. And he, the two interviews he did for us focused on his life growing up in Gawler. And the second one was about his life as a, uh, as a soldier in World War II. Uh, he is one of the few surviving rats of Tobruk. But anyway, before we say any more, let's just have a listen. And I'm hoping the uh, audio works okay. Realising that there was a war, and uh, I was 24 at the time, and uh, I decided to join up. So on the 24th of June 1940, I joined up. So there were quite a number of us enlisted in Gawler, and then we had to go to Wavell, get fitted out, and that sort of thing. But uh, it was when I was been to the quartermaster's store to get my uniforms, and I was walking back to where we were camped in the behind the grandstands at Wavell in the sheep pavilions. But I was walking along there and I met a, a Major Hutton. And Major Hutton had been in camp at Gawler with the mounted rifles um, for several years prior to the war. As I was walking back, it was coming the opposite direction with Major Hutton. And it, I had met, met him at, at our house because Dad had had entertained both he and Colonel West uh, on numerous occasions uh, over those years. And he said, you know, he said, he said, what are you doing here? I said, I've just joined up. He said, what are you, what unit are you going to? I said, I've got no idea. I had no idea how many units at that stage. And uh, he said, well, I and Colonel West uh, forming a field ambulance. Would you like to join? I said, well, I suppose that's as good as anything. And he took me back to the quarters and introduced me to uh, Major Burns. And that's how I finished up in field ambulance. The, the interview we did with Sid Eye is something we're really proud of because it was placed on the RSL Virtual War Memorial and has actually been downloaded by several schools in New South Wales where they've actually used it as a project. So if the discussion tonight is about why oral history is actually important, Sid Eye is a classic example of why that's the case. Anyway, let's talk about something uh, a little bit more mundane about the birth of the oral history group. A little over two years ago, the Gawler Community Broadcasting Association decided that they, to, to appoint a project officer to facilitate the setting up of a Gawler oral history project. And I'm really pleased tonight that the chair of the Gawler Broadcasting Association, Angus Millican, is here tonight. So, Angus, can you just stand up and do a bit of a spin around? I'm not here to embarrass him, but... Uh, <laughs> so, there we go. But the dream at the time was and is about recording the oral histories of people who have made Gawler their home. The dream was and still is to create an archive of oral history podcasts which would be made accessible to current and future historians anywhere on our planet via the World Wide Web. The dream was and is to encourage and train and support local people to do the interviews, to do the editing, to make the transcripts, to prepare the podcast, and to build and market an attractive, easy to use website. So oral history is important. 
it recognises that the experiences and observations of everyday people add an important dimension, clarity and understanding to the history of a community and also a nation. Academic institutions in some countries are now recognising this and have put in place oral history departments. And we'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. Now let's just think about Gawla just for a minute and our very significant and important history. Thankfully, much has been documented, painted, photographed and diarised. However, as with all communities, much has not. Just think how much richer our early history would be if we had the stories and observations of school teachers, nurses, foundry workers, grocers, farmers, Aboriginal families, shopkeepers, shop assistants, telephonists, young people, mothers, fathers, drivers, carers, parishioners, immigrants. So it's, this is one of the key reasons why we're involved in oral history. It's really important I acknowledge um, at this stage a small group of organisations in Gawler who've really actively supported us. Naturally the Gawler Broadcasting Association which founded us. The Gawler History Team who from day one have actually helped us. The Gawler Environment and Heritage Association and the Gawler National Trust. So before I say any more, I'd actually like to uh, just show a couple of other little interviews. The first one is with Iris Crouch. Unfortunately, Iris Crouch died recently. We actually ended, we did three interviews with her, and uh, she, a, a wonderful story of resilience. And the short excerpt I'm going to play for you is when, as a child, she actually helped out on a farm. And that's going to be followed by a, a, a short excerpt from someone you know well, uh, one Mr. G. Tucker, who's sitting back there. So but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Now, I'm actually uh, working around the website. I'll demonstrate the website to you a little bit later, but this is just to pick up the stories. Scrolling down, we find uh, Iris Crouch. The three or four horses in the trolley, and uh, the men would load the hay, and then when they came into the hay yard, I'd be at one side of the stack, of a stack and the guy on the, the you know, trolley would throw me the sheaf of hay and I'd throw it across the stack to Dad who was building. So that's been more of my life than, and I've never wore trousers. I've got no regrets because I think working outside, although I was only small, my body was strong. She was a remarkable individual. She was about this high and as feisty as they come. And it, I, don't, I think she lived her entire life in that way. Now, the next person we've got is Graham Tucker. Graham is actually a really interesting person because basically Graham actually only came to Gore when he was fairly senior in age. But he's actually become in a relatively short time a bit of an authority on a whole range of subjects to do with Gawler history. So it was a great delight when... Uh, Maureen McKenzie actually got a, managed to get an interview with Graham, but uh, the short excerpt we're going to play for you now, I'll just bring that up, bear with me. Going alongside Ute House, there's an L-shaped private laneway, and you can walk around that and you can see what was the front of the house from that. In the back of the house, well facing there, on the branch, there's like two there. stone buildings there. One of them for a long time was a uh, little school, the Missy's somebody ran a little school there. Mm -hmm. And the other one was a bakery. And one of the bakers that was in it, probably towards the end of its uh, existence as a bakery, uh, was an Assender. And Assenders now, of course, have uh, brought us out bakery. In yeah. fact, I'm told there's still a baker's oven left in that building. 
the, the interview with Graham goes for about 45 minutes and it's full of that kind of factual information about different parts of Gawler. So let's talk a little bit about what actually is oral history. The oral history movement really began back in the 1970s and it started in the United Kingdom. And uh, one of the origi original, I guess, prime movers in it was a person by the name of Paul Thompson who was a research professor at the University of Essex. And he said in 1978, oral history gives history back to the people in their own words. And in giving a past, it also helps them towards a future of their own making. So in many ways, oral history has transformed the practice of contemporary history. Whereas interviews of significant political and social citizens have been evident in documented history, and they, re and they still remain vital to the critical examination of written history, rarely has the voice of the ordinary person been recorded as part of that style of documented historical evidence. And that's what oral history is all about. A contemporary of uh, Paul Thompson was Stu Turkle, who said at an oral history conference several years ago, he said, if I were to ask the audience now who built the pyramids, our first reflex reaction is the pharaohs. And as he points out, he says, the pharaohs didn't lift a finger. They may have been responsible for it, but no, it was the slaves, the anonymous ones through the centuries who built the pyramids. And he said, I'm interested in those millions and multi-millions of people who down through the centuries who made the wheels go around, but never made our traditional history books. We hear of the generals, we hear of the kings and the queens. We have great industrialists and we have great states people. But who are these others? And that's, now one of these others that we have is a, a woman by the name of Jean Evans. Some of you may know Jean, she's in her mid 90s, and here's another feisty individual, I tell you, no doubt about it. She was interviewed by Judy Gillett Ferguson. And uh, we were very interested in Jean because she actually started her nursing career at the Hutchinson Hospital in 1942, right in the middle of the war. She was also present at the Gawler Hospital for the first caesarean birth. Uh, she actually was working at the RAH in Adelaide when they first started using penicillin. And also that she has a whole range of observations and experiences in the interview about the life as a nurse. But the little bit we're going to play with for you tonight is about the first experience with radium. Because there was a time when we used to inject people with radium, with therapy. There she is as a young, a young nurse. We were on night duty, we had to clean out the theatre from where they'd operate in the day. You had to scrub the floor and pick up all the swabs and dressings and do everything. And uh, this night, there were three of us down in General Hospital. We cleaned up the theatre and done everything and had everything all thrown in the bin. But we, anyway, we were on night duty, see, the next day, we, the next thing, the matron came up and woke us all up. And she said, uh, do you remember seeing some radium in the theatre yesterday? And we didn't know what radium was. Oh, we didn't know this. And she said, because it can't be found, and asbestos is ringing, that he left its radium. And it was in a knee, I don't know whether he did, what syringe is used to be in a long chrome sort of knee, needle holder. The radium, the Australian needle, it's in a little hole, a thing about a foot long, and we didn't know what it was, so we cleaned up, threw it in the bin. Anyway, she came and she said, we've got to come down now and find it. If you don't find it, you're all going to get the sack. Oh. Anyway, <coughs> we went through the rubbish bin with all the swabs and all the dressing and all the thing. The mayor was this bit needle hole with the radium. That's how radium first started, just like a long needle. And it was in the hole, we'd never seen it before, didn't even know what it was. <laughs> what did they use it for then? Well, probably cancer and okay. lupus and things oh, like that. Because yeah. yeah. I can remember when we were at the Adelaide Hospital, it used to be in a box. Right. Uh, we put under people's beds. And then they used to tell us that we weren't to get close to it, it could make us sterile. Oh my goodness. There you go, so how's that, eh? <laughs> Radium therapy. Gotta love it. And she's full of those stories, and she's funny. I mean, uh, it's hilarious, in fact. 
as she reflects on some of her experiences as a nurse in Gawla. So now for a little bit of, I guess, boring project management stuff, because really what, what the Gawler Broadcasting Association Board wanted was actually an ethical project with good governance. And so we were actually very much guided by the Oral History Australia model. So, and, and, uh, so we actually set up an advisory group which consisted of David Ward, Helen Hennessy, Janet, Jeanette Manhennett, Margaret Howes, Judy Gillett Ferguson, and Angus Millican as the uh, chair of GBA. Now on that board are basically a representative of the Gawler History Team, a representative of the Gawler National Trust, a representative of GIHA, and a representative of the Gawler Broadcasting Association. And that was actually very deliberate, because we really, from the very early days, wanted to establish strong ties with the National Trust and the History Team in Gawler. Okay, so we, uh, we read the Oral History Australia manual to get an idea of what we should be doing. And we actually absorbed that and we established policies in relation to copyright, usage agreements, interview agreements, police checks, training, and, the, and, a, and an end-to-end -end process. But most of all, we actually established a guiding principle which was actually about respect. Because the most important part of our history is about respect for the person you're interviewing. We're not, not quasi-journalists chasing up like secret stories about families. I mean, it's our job to try and create a comfortable environment for the person we're interviewing so that they can comfortably and easily tell their story to the best of their ability. So that's... Um, now on top of doing that, we also actually uh, had to attract vo volunteers to actually do these interviews. And we also had to do quite a bit of work on website development. Now I know uh, Brian talks a bit about the work that Ian did on your website and the stuff he does. To actually do website work actually takes hours and uh, David Ward actually added the pages to the existing Google Broadcasting Association website to not only create an archive where we can actually put all the oral histories but to also create a resource for oral historians anywhere and I'll show you a bit about that in a second so we're doing pretty well for time. So in a minute, I just want to talk to you a bit about the process we put in place, which is about respecting the individual. But the next person I want to play an audio from is for Wayne Clark. We actually approached the RSL early last year about interviewing some of the, some of the veterans, about their time in Gawler, and also about some of their service experience. Wayne and a couple of others volunteered for that. But the part I want to play for you tonight is, with the first interview we did with him, he actually talks about his boyhood in Gawler, and it's really lovely to hear some of what goes on. He actually spoke in detail about the various, uh, about the river system, uh, swimming in the, the, in the ponds and, and that sort of stuff, but he also spoke about some cellars which exist in some buildings where as young lads uh, they actually went swimming. So I just want to find that part and play it for you. The uh, part of Gawler he's talking about here is where the Foodland supermarket is now. There was a lot of business in uh, getting hay and chaff for horses and a lot of people uh, made their living out looking after the horses and there was one big sort of storehouse on the uh, road just around by Foodland quite a large building and uh, it was set up so that uh, people could come along with their horse and cart drays and they would be able to unload bags of grain and bags of chaff and, and uh, it was a very large building, something which uh, a lot of people now don't realise is that a lot of the bigger old buildings used to have a cellar under them which was actually lined with very good plaster which was waterproof, and they used to make what was called a, uh, a water ta underground water tax. Now these water tanks, this particular one was a huge one, the, the galvanised roof, which was considered a wonderful thing, the drain pipes from the roof 
didn't run out into the gutters, it used to run down into this system, I used to call it, and that was the water. Now that system was about five or six feet deep, and uh, it was probably about 30 or 40 yards long by about 20, 20 yards wide. There used to be uh, ventilations, slats, that were underneath where the uh, horse and drays used to line up. And uh, when it was very, very, very hot, uh, we used to occasionally go down there and lift one of these uh, vents up and we would hop in there and we would swim around in this underground system and we had to be very careful because the water in those systems was freezing cold. And of course the other thing was that we were very small and the water was far, far over our heads and consequently we had to sort of just crawl around the edge of it. There were several girls and boys, the Hicks family were one of them. We didn't used to tell everybody about this spot but uh, it, we, uh, we used to use it as a little special spot and it was good. So, so that's... Look, that is really interesting because one of the things we, we find when people have actually grown up in Gawler, they all tell these sorts of stories of the stuff that used to happen. And it's, it's, so we're slowly but surely trying to gather the information about early life in Gawler, you know, back in around the 40s and 50s and that sort of time period. So, okay, let's talk a bit about process. Okay, this is our so-called respectful process. When we actually do an oral history interview, the first thing we do is we actually have a preliminary interview with the person who's interested interested in that being interviewed. The idea of that is to explain their rights in the whole process because they control the whole, pr whole process. Nothing gets developed into a podcast and placed on any website until they actually fully approve the final product. So at that preliminary interview we actually show them the sort of recording equipment we're going to use. Now what I'd like to do now is actually show you uh, this is a Zoom H1 recording equipment. Now, Angus there has actually got a couple of other bits he'll stand up and show you around, and I have to move back because Brian's telling me to do the right thing. These are about $120. These are actually really good quality recorders. What Angus is holding up there is a Zoom H H2, and we also have another one called a Zoom H6. These are so they're, they're actually very good quality recording implements. However, you can actually record with a, as many of you would know, you can do an oral history with that. You can do an oral history with a, a computer, do an oral history with an iPad. So we chose to use these. They're very good quality recording equipment and we'll continue to use them. So, thanks for that, Angus. Yeah. Okay, so once the person has agreed to the interview, we go through the preliminary process we actually arrange the interview time. Most of our interviews we actually do in the person's home. We do it somewhere where they are comfortable. If they want to do the interview somewhere else, that's fine. We've actually experimented with doing a couple of interviews in the new Civic Centre. Um, we had a few little issues there with um, poor acoustics, but we'll, we'll get through that. So we do the interview, and those interviews can vary from like half an hour to around about an hour and a half. Quite often with some people we actually end up doing second and third interviews. Like our Iris Crouch we interviewed three times, Sid I twice. After the interview is done, basically we do some basic editing. Because a lot of people um, um and are ah quite a bit, so we just remove a little bit of that. After we've done the basic editing, we also do a transcript. The transcript is probably one of the most important things you're doing for an with an oral history. So so the interview takes about, to, say, let's say it takes about an hour, you do the editing, that might take half an hour. To actually do a transcript for a half hour or hour interview will take anywhere from five to ten hours, but it's critically important. So once we've done that, it goes back to the, the person, they get a copy of the audio, they get a copy of the transcript, and they get a chance to listen to that to see if they actually are happy with the content. Once they're happy with it, we actually then convert it into a podcast and we put it on the Gawler Broadcasting Association website. We also take a copy, we give a copy to the Gawler Library and we also send a copy to the State Library. But it's not developed into a podcast 
or a uh, or sent off to the libraries until the person totally approves of the final product. So that's what we do there. Now, now finally, with the uh, the next couple of interviews, one is with uh, Brian Sample. Now we interviewed Brian Sample not because he has been a very active politician in Gawler, like he was mayor for a period of eight years. Brian Sample, when he was young, was actually one of South Australia's motocross champions. So we actually wanted to interview him about his life as a motorcycle rider. So there's a very short excerpt, which only goes for 45 seconds, and we love this because it's so typ typical Brian. For those of you who might know Brian to some extent, he's wonderful to interview because you can just put a mic in front of him, turn it on, and away he goes. So, so. And the second person we are going to play for is Lil Crosby. Lil Crosby is um, another dynamo. She joined the WAF in the last year of World War II. And so the, the interview was basically about her experiences in the WAF. So we have a short excerpt where she talks about some of her basic training and her experiences there. Okay, so this only goes for 45 seconds, but there is as a young man. I suppose over the years I, I had uh, many different types of bikes. Uh, I did try sidecar uh, riding at one stage, but just couldn't get the, the feel. And you had to have a very good passenger to be able to do that. But uh, always with Hondas, uh, so I, I really got to know them and did my own repairs and and that sort of thing on them. Did very well, smashed up a few times, which you naturally, you, you, they say you don't become a good rider unless you get smashed up a few times. Yeah. I suppose the highlight of that was winning the South Australian uh, motocross at uh, uh, Brooks Gully, which is up at One Tree Hill up there. Um, that, that was a real highlight. But there's, Brian, there's nothing like getting smashed up a few times to uh, learn how to ride a motorcycle. And this is the wonderful little Crosby. Blue Crosby, as I said, joined the WAF basically at the end of 1944. And uh, the interview is a classic. She is as funny as a fit. She is, she is so sharp. And her memory is razor sharp. And she's very, very bright. After leaving school a bit early, and uh, decided to I was better off earning a little a bit of money. So but then I was there two and a half years, and then I joined. Uh, they were calling out for women, beautiful advertisements to join, and we were in a bit of a predicament. That was very threatening to Australia. Yes. And uh, they were sending the boys up north, and, uh, and urging the women to come in and do the job. Bear with me, sorry. I don't know why we've lost that, but... Uh... We can edit that. So, I sat for, with 300 of us sat for an exam to join the Air Force. And we spent the whole day going from one specialist to another to examine you from head to foot. And we were 18, I was just 18 then, mm -hmm. and uh, 18 and four months. So I became a teleprinter operator. They chose what they thought you should be uh, doing. Went to Melbourne for rookies. Yes. Back to Adelaide for typing lessons in Floyd Gibson Building. Oh, and we had to march every day from North Adelaide to Commode Street to 
Foy Gibson and Batty Gale. So what, you marched in formation? Yes, yes. and we used to give an eyes right, and the sergeant gave us an eyes right or, or when we saw a couple on the lawn having a little cuddle. <laughs> and that was a known thing because it was an eyes right. <laughs> anyway, 40 words a minute and then we were off back to the posting. And I, I preferred Melbourne. I had a choice of Gore or Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And so I said, Melbourne, well, we trained for Pelopita work at Point Cook. And the sun used to go in for three days and not come out. So, <laughs> so that's the wonderful one, Little Crosby. And uh, of, of all the oral histories we've done, that is the one that's been downloaded the most. That, uh, and it goes for about 40, 40 minutes or up. So. Now, it's 25 past eight. What I want to show you a little bit is about the, uh, the website, what's on there. And I actually want to show you a couple of very short videos which actually discuss why oral history is important. And uh, once again, I'll, I'll say the, the website, a lot of the development work there was done by David Ward from our... From our Oral History Advisory Group, fantastic person. The two videos I want to show you, basically one was made in Canada and one was made in the United States of America. What's clear in the US and Canada is that um, we have, they have, they take oral history very seriously, so much so that they've established oral history departments in many universities. In Australia, the, the oral history, OHA, Oral History Australia, is a very, very active group, very supportive. But uh, the only universities that have anything to do with oral history in Australia are the University of Tasmania, where they run a family history course, which has one subject of oral history in it. And then just recently, the University of South Australia actually opened up an oral history hub. They're not doing much yet, but they've just started something, which is really promising. However, in... Um, in, in Canada, taken very seriously indeed, and also in the US. So let me just show you a bit, just very quickly, some parts of the website. So what you have here is a list of resources that actually gives the um, that's a link to all the oral history organisations in, in Australia. There are various technical tips that uh, David's found. He's put on the website. Then there are why oral history. This, this is a link to various videos. Both of these videos go for three minutes. Now, one was actually made by the University of Winnipeg. The other one was made by the Minnesota Historical Society. The Minnesota Historical Society have been doing oral history since 1948. This, this is a very popular state in the US, but they have been so influential that they've got tie-ins with most of the schools and colleges in Minnesota. So, whereas the, the first video was made by professional uh, historians, at, at a university. The second one was actually made by students, mentored by um, adults, but uh, they're quite different. Talk about the same thing, but quite different. So, what is all of this? Oral history means many different things to many different people. But academics have defined oral history since the late 1940s as a research method that asks eyewitnesses to talk about their lives and their own experiences in usually very extensive uh, life history interviews or event-focused interviews. For example, Oral histories would be conducted with workers about the strike, uh, which is an event, or about growing up in a mining town, which is an experience, or they would do a life history interview where they would begin with childhood or perhaps their parents or their grandparents and then take it up to the present. 
we are interested in people's memories of their lives, in the stories they tell about their lives. We are interested in people's experiences. We are not interviewing them as experts of certain subjects, but rather we are interviewing them as experts of their own lives. And so um, our history interviews are similar in some regards to interviews, life history interviews that are being done, other social sciences, other qualitative social sciences. One of the major differences is that we archive interviews. So we uh, put a lot of emphasis on the audio quality of the interviews, which not only makes it easier to transcribe, but also makes these interviews into documents that can be used by filmmakers, by radio producers, uh, by other researchers. We archive interviews because we believe that there's lasting value to the interviews that we do. From an academic perspective, a research perspective, this gives other researchers access to the sources that we use, which is something that is very common in history. Other researchers are given the opportunity to listen to the interviews that we conduct to see if they agree or disagree with our own interpretations of these interviews. At the Oral History Center, we usually conduct life history interviews that develop over two phases. In the first phase, we simply ask people to tell their life history, and they can take as long as they wish. In some cases, they take half an hour, and in other cases, they take 10 hours. And in the second phase, we then ask follow-up questions where we try to get at the uh, social and historical context uh, of their lives. We have specific questions about childhood, about their grandparents and their families, about their work lives, about their family lives, and so on. So this is what oral history is. As a research method, it's, a very, it's very diverse. There are a great range of um, approaches to, uh, to doing interviews. But one of the principles of interviews is that we want to get people's experiences and memories in the form of stories. Okay, very formal, very serious, and they do they do thousands of interviews. This is very different. I won't play all of this because we're starting to run out of time. No, you're right. These are kids. Hi, I'm Becca. And I'm Joe. I'm Jenny. And I'm Monica. And we are here to tell you why we do oral histories. I've been doing oral histories for six years as part of the National History Day program. I can tell you that these experiences bring people together in many ways. In addition, it's so important for researchers to do this kind of first-hand research and contribute this person's story to our current historical record. It does not require a lot of experience or equipment to do an oral history, so anyone can do it. From amateur historians to students to academic historians. Oral history requires that you think about other times and places, ask important questions, and then analyze how that person's story intersects with or enhances what you already know about a certain topic or time period. So, why should we do oral histories? Oral histories are the real stories of real people that sometimes don't come across in a textbook or history book. You, as the oral historian, will not only hear what the person is telling you, but also observe how they were saying it. You can read in a textbook that life was really difficult during the Depression, but it is not the same as the emotion you feel during an interview. Oral history allows us to capture the voices of people who are often left out of historical accounts. Oral history allows us to preserve our stories. Very few of us in today's society write letters or write in a diary. Our communication is instantaneous and disposable, so we will have very few written documents that will inform future generations about what our daily life is like. How often do you print your emails or your texts? Oral history builds a sense of community and bridges the gap between generations. Oral history projects help teach students important social skills and also address state and national education standards related to historical thinking. Now that you know why we do oral histories, let's look at the specific components of an oral history project. 
what is oral history? Oral history is primary source material collected in an interview with someone who participated in or witnessed an event or a way of life. It's done for the purpose of preserving the information and making it available to others. There are eight key elements of oral histories. Careful attention to copyright. A structured, well-researched interview format. Thoughtfully written questions and follow-up questions that ask for additional detail. A controlled and recorded interview setting. Collection of first-hand information that goes beyond the current historical record. Use of high-quality recording equipment careful processing of the materials, and making the oral history available to others through a local repository. This series of podcasts will address each of these eight elements of oral history and take you through the steps of the oral history process. Good luck with your project. Goodbye. That is quite astounding when you think that those students have actually made about eight of those videos. And uh, I find them really entertaining, really informative, very factual, very useful. And uh, quite a demonstration when you think that how far, re realistically in Australia, we have to go with oral history when the Minnesota have been doing it since 1948. Now it's, it's uh, 25 to 9, so I, I really should close up here, but what, what I'd like to do is just acknowledge once again those organisations that have helped us, basically all of our volunteers. At, uh, at, at this stage we only have about three, but over time we've, ha we've had Judy Gillett Ferguson doing interviews, Helen Hennessy, we've had Jeanette, we've had Marilyn, I've, I've done a couple of interviews, and also Rod McKenzie and Maureen McKenzie. Without them we would be really struggling. And also, for all those volunteers who actually allowed us to interview them and have trusted us with their oral history. Because realistically, we are not professionals. We are just a small bunch of well-intentioned amateurs. And uh, we've certainly made a few stuff-ups here and there, but basically we're learning as we go. Currently, we're uh, starting to learn how to do videos, and we've got about four videos in production at the moment. Long way to go there. There must be questions for Barry. Yes. Sorry, yep. who, who owns the copyright and intellectual property of your final podcast? I, th th that is owned by the, uh, the person we interviewed and the Gawler Broadcasting Association. What we do when, when the person has finally approved of the product, we get them to sign uh, what's called a usage agreement. So, and it's only if they... That, they understand that we will be placing the podcast on a website and also giving copies to libraries. So um, once, once they sign that usage agreement, basically then, and it goes on the website, then it can go anywhere. Now at the beginning of our podcast and at the end of them, we actually put writers about ensuring, asking, um, I guess, students or listeners that if they use that, either the transcript or the... Uh, uh, the, the audio in any in any way that they give appropriate attribution to the person who was interviewed and to the person who did the interview and also to the Gawler Broadcasting Association. The reality is we don't have any sort of muscle to enforce that, but we actually ask them to at least do the respectful thing. Okay, thanks. No worries. Thank you. Other questions? Right. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Ray first. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's your problem now. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. That was a great show tonight. But I do have a question. Wayne Clark come across with, with the uh, story of uh, swimming in the, in the cellars the building and things yeah. like that, which really didn't eventuate. But how factual do these... They're only people's perceptions. Yeah. That's exactly that. Yeah, right. Oral histories are people's perceptions and they are their, their memories. For instance, Wayne talks about this cellar being 20, uh, you know, basically 20 metres or 20 yards by, by 30 yards. Um, I think he might have been talking about feet, actually. But, yes. but, but who not yet? Yeah. It certainly wasn't that big. Yeah. What he was talking about was a particular uh, underground tank. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, yeah. And that was only 
wasn't that big. No, it was right. deep. It was about 12, mm -hmm. 30, 40 foot deep. Mm -hmm. And we never used to go in there because they had crocodiles and had alligators and snakes in there. So but we were kids and uh, yeah. we used to test the water and that was about it. But, so you went in there too? Yeah, we lived there. That was our. Oh. That was on our property. What? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we used to have all the kids from the neighbourhood come yeah. around and uh, the place was called the cement linings where it was a big property and yeah. Uh, yeah. kids used to come around and do what they wanted to do. And we had horse yards around there as well, so it was a quite exciting area. Well done. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, who was it, Stan? Stan. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to distract you too far, but oral history to me was always thought about in terms of primitive cultures that didn't have literature. Okay. Uh, what's your sort of view compared to what we're doing today with modern technology involved, compared to the people, and did uh, was there a, a possibility that the history actually changed as it was being told down through the years? Oh, a good question, Stan. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, oral history goes back thousands of years. I mean, we, we stand here in the land between the rivers, and uh, I mean, a Aboriginal and the Ghana people have been here for thousands of years who had a very strong oral history tradition. However, as we know, I mean, most of that has been lost. But in terms of like, modern recorded oral history, that I guess it was reinvigorated in the United Kingdom back in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, Back in the 70s, it was called an oral history movement. I mean, there was a really strong movement about this, uh, get, getting this going. And in the English-speaking countries like the US, Canada, and Australia, uh, that's, that's where it started. Um, so, yeah, it's still going. In terms of perceptions of accuracy and how it's changing, I don't know, Stan. One of the things with oral history is it's about people's memories, about their perceptions. So. I've now asked Ian MacDonald, who kindly volunteered at the last second to be, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Barrett. I just hope in that cellar there was a sign saying, don't be at the pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I particularly liked the second video you had there, and it is important because people these days do not write letters. They send an email, but sort of fades off into the distance somewhere. There's nothing written down, so it's very important that we get these people these days, the, especially the older people that can tell us the story, because once that person's gone, there's no story. So thanks very much, and I would like, just like to give you a little gift. Thank you. As a so token of our appreciation, thank you very much. Ha, ha, ha.